Thanks to you and to the other Carmen for um, allowing me to, to speak today. It will seem as though I'm out on a limb in, in many ways, but there are some common threads here. My background is in neuroscience. I have a PhD in cellular neuroscience. And um, this talk is really about biomarker research. So um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and a former postdoc whose name is Dr. Sepanud Farouzmand, who did a great deal of this work. And I just want to be really transparent and say that I'm not claiming her work as my own. Um, you know, we worked together, but she did the vast majority of the legwork on this, and I'm very grateful to her for her efforts. So very long title, and I can't read it out because that will take 15 minutes, um, but I will introduce each of the elements as we go along. I'm going to talk about urinary symptoms, and it seems odd that somebody with a PhD in neuroscience would want to apply their trade to the um, urinary system. But the rationale for doing that is in my first bullet point, that 70% of all adults experience some degree of urinary symptoms. That can be an acute episode like a urinary tract infection, but for many people, unfortunately, it's chronic urinary symptoms. And there are lots of studies. This is a very recent study from Poland, but there are lots of large studies from many other countries, and we see very similar um, prevalence. And when we say urinary symptoms, what do we mean? Well, we mean symptoms that affect the storage of urine. So as your bladder fills with urine, that can be increased frequency of voiding, uh, waking during the night to void, uh, sensation of urinary urgency. So that's when you feel that you have to desperately go to the bathroom, you have to go right now, which you all may be experiencing, and incontinence. Um, but it could also be voiding symptoms. And there's a long list here. So some examples would be painful urination or um, hesitancy, so you can't quite go, you, you need to go, but it doesn't come to start off with, etc. And I won't read out the entire list. And then sometimes some other symptoms as well. So blood in the urine, abdominal pain or loin pain, which is sort of at the, the lower back to the sides where the kidneys are, that type of thing. So there's a whole host of different symptoms. And a challenge for urology is to distinguish the cause of those symptoms so as to treat the patient. And if we focus just on one of those symptoms, this sensation of urinary urgency, the desire to avoid contents of one bladder urgently, we've got to dash to the bathroom, that can be caused by a number of different things. So firstly, it can be caused by what we drink and how much we drink. So that could be the fluid intake, whether it contains caffeine, alcohol, something that irritates the bladder or causes the smooth muscle cells of the bladder to contract in the case of caffeine. It could also be to do with the um, amount of liquid and the timing of that liquid. Um, in many cases, however, it's pathological. And so there are a whole number of different diseases or disorders that cause this sensation of urinary urgency. Um, likewise, it can be situation dependent. So we've all been on a train or we've all walked in to our house or flat um, having been away. And then suddenly you feel the need, the desperate need to rush to the bathroom. And then finally, many medications produce directly a sensation of urgency, or they have a side effect to increase uh, the fluid absorption from the body to increase the amount of urine production, which in turn can result in urgency. So the aim of producing a slide like this is just to illustrate there can be lots of different causes of a particular symptom. And then when we think about the different pathologies that a urologist will encounter, um, I created this terrible uh, abacus-like structure here where we have a number of different symptoms along the top. We have a number of different pathologies down the left-hand side, and we can see that there's a great deal of overlap. Now, my specialism is overactive bladder. This is what I've been working on for the last 10 years. And we can see that there's a big overlap between its characteristic symptoms, which are urgency, that I just described, waking to void, increased frequency and incontinence. So those symptoms, as well as the symptoms of other conditions like a urinary tract infection, for example. So the challenge for a clinician is to distinguish the cause of a patient's symptoms. When a patient comes into a surgery, what's the cause of their symptoms? Because it's the cause that will determine the treatment. And if the treatment is incorrect, then the symptoms won't be improved, okay? So unfortunately, we have a fairly graphic slide, um, and this is the favoured measures of clinicians around the world to diagnose overactive bladder. And it's to take an invasive measurement of the pressure of the bladder as it fills with urine. 
So two probes are inserted. The first is inserted into the bladder and the second is inserted into another abdominal orifice. So that can be the rectum, in females it can be the vagina, and it's to cancel out changes in abdominal pressure. So if the patient moves around a tiny bit, if they cough or, or, or talk or whatever, it causes pressure changes within the abdomen. We need to remove those pressure changes to get a clean record of the pressure changes within the bladder as the bladder fills with urine. Now in a uh, quote unquote healthy patient, the bladder will just expand to accommodate urine. But in, in somebody um, who has a particular hallmark, what happens is the bladder will contract and it will contract involuntarily. Um, for you and I, uh, assuming that you're healthy and assuming that I'm healthy, our bladder will only contract when we want it to contract, when we're uh, in the bathroom, okay? But for a certain number of patients, we'll get these involuntary contractions of the bladder. So this is a, a method that many people believe is the gold standard way of diagnosing overactive bladder, but of course, unfortunately it's not. So in 2005, so 15, 16 years ago, um, scientists, clinicians found that actually there was very little overlap between this hallmark, this, these pressure changes and symptoms in patients. And you could track a patient over many years and they don't go on to develop disease if they have this hallmark. So there's very little overlap between this particular measurement and a patient's bladder health. So the method itself is insensitive. And that was shown, but still for reasons that I can't explain, many clinicians still feel that this is an appropriate measure to take. Now it's clearly highly invasive and you'll have to take my word for it that it's expensive. So it's done in a hospital. It requires a team of people, um, at least one of whom are very highly trained to interpret the traces that come from these measurements. Um, and so it costs around a thousand US dollars a time, 1500 US dollars a time to do this procedure. Um, and crucially, it's not a procedure you could do on every patient. So if you have a patient who is frail, um, particularly elderly, you wouldn't be doing this measure on that individual. And you can't do this measure on multiple occasions to try to understand the development of somebody's condition because they might let you do it once, but they wouldn't let you do it twice because it's uncomfortable and highly invasive. Okay, so what we wanted to do is to see whether we could develop an alternative. And the postdoc, Seppi, um, went out with some funding and she spoke to stakeholders and they included clinicians, they included um, members of our healthcare service um, in terms of the people that make the decisions about what we use and what we don't use, um, but they also crucially included patients and carers. And she specifically asked the question, well, you know, if that technique doesn't work for you, then what would you like to see? And there are five points. The first is that people want a technique which can be used at the point of care setting. So this isn't about going in a car, driving a long distance to a hospital and having an invasive measure. This is a technique that could be done at point of care. So a GP surgery, a pharmacy or a nursing care home, not in the hospital. Secondly, the technique has to be accurate. So we need to address the problem with the method that I've just talked about, about its inaccuracy. We need, we need to be able to differentiate overactive bladder from similarly presenting conditions and diseases. We need to be able to distinguish between the different rows of that, that abacus slide that I presented two or three slides ago. Thirdly, the technique has to be non-invasive because it has to be suitable for all patients, including the frail elderly. We have to have a rapid outcome. Uh, a huge problem with urology and a lot of medicine is this need to take a sample and then send it away to a lab and then there's a, a, a long process of um, you know, growing a sample or processing a sample and then there's time that it takes for the results to come back, uh, be interpreted and then for the patient a week, two weeks later to have the, the result confirmed. So the idea would be to have a single appointment um, where there's an outcome straight away with no need to send the sample away. And then finally, that the test would be simple to use and to interpret without any need for specialist training or specialist laboratory equipment, as would be expected in a point of care setting. So that's what people wanted. And that's what we tried our best over the last four or five years to try to develop. So 
CEPI recruited 113 participants who had early stage symptoms indicative of overactive bladder. So they had the four symptoms that I described previously, okay? But to a degree where they weren't homebound, they weren't in a, a nursing home, um, but they were, they exhibited mild to moderate symptoms. The next thing to do is to characterize those participants by asking them questions to try to understand the potential basis for their symptoms. So that would include trying to rule out those individuals that might have the symptoms for reasons other than overactive bladder, um, to understand what medicines they've been on or, or, or might be currently on, um, to try to characterize the individual. And the individual then provided a midstream urine sample that then we could characterize with tests within the lab, including proteomic and genomic analyses. Um, we also performed tests, microbiology tests, et cetera, to try to rule out other diseases with overlapping symptoms. So to rule out cancer and to rule out things like urinary tract infection, which we could do with other tests. So the result is what I'm hoping to illustrate at the bottom is to have a pure overactive bladder population rather than have a population of individuals that perhaps have the same symptoms, but for different reasons. So we did our very best to rule out individuals with um, perhaps other causes. So the next thing we did, and, and this is slightly novel in neurology, is we used statistical approaches in a way that hadn't really been done too much in the field previously. So rather than try to define our patient groups based on some arbitrary measure, we used cluster analysis to see whether there were any natural groupings within our um, data set. And we allowed a maximum of 15 different groups, but we found two different groups defined by symptom severity. So the first group on the left-hand side, cluster one, had individuals with basically no urinary symptoms whatsoever. Whereas on the right-hand side, cluster two, are individuals defined by the extent to which they exhibit the four different symptoms of overactive bladder. So these individuals on the right-hand side have mild to moderate overactive bladder, and on the left, they are asymptomatic. And then CEPI and other people within the lab characterized the concentration of putative urinary biomarkers within urine samples of those same participants. And we have here on a number of different graphs that I'll present, we have the concentration of those biomarkers on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis that I'll show you, we have the severity of different symptoms that characterize overactive bladder. So this is all the symptoms combined. From low, we have an individual, in this case female, um, with, with essentially asymptomatic, so this person is uh, happy and uh, they, they're not suffering. Whereas if they have a high score, then they have developed overactive bladder symptoms and um, they would be suffering. They'd be waking during the night, they'd be rushing to the bathroom and they'd probably be incontinent as well. So we have individuals along that spectrum of symptom severity and within the urine of those individuals, we have increasing amounts of a urinary biomarker. And the key thing to notice here is that most of the people we recruited have fairly mild to moderate symptoms. So we looked at a number of different putative biomarkers and we've got um, pages and pages of graphs. Uh, and depending on the biomarker, we see correlations between the concentration and the extent of symptom severity for either total symptoms combined or individual symptoms like urgency or the extent of a person's incontinence. So it says strong correlations, but to be honest, some are strong and some are, are weak. Um, and there we are. Now, the problem with this particular approach is that it's not particularly useful for diagnosis. Where does one draw a line that could be used in a clinic to diagnose somebody as having overactive bladder or not? Um, so the next step, which was relatively novel for urology, was to use multivariate statistics to look at a number of different factors together, a number of different variables together to see whether we could more accurately predict which of the two clusters, asymptomatic or early symptom progression, which of the two clusters uh, an individual would belong to. Okay, so we use logistic regression. And there's some overlap to some of the language that I'll use that you'll have come across when we're talking about COVID and some of the tests used to diagnose whether somebody has got COVID at a particular time. 
So this is a graph that I use in my teaching. So forgive me if it's a little bit patronizing. Um, the method that's used to determine whether a biomarker is going to be of use clinically is this receiver operating characteristic or rock curve. And we plot the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. And in English, what that really means is on this y-axis, we have a you're not pregnant to you're pregnant. So our ability to detect something like pregnancy. And then on the x-axis, our ability to distinguish somebody who's not pregnant from being pregnant. So here we have um, a rather worried looking gentleman, but with an impressive mustache, who is being told by a clinician who also has an impressive mustache um, that they're pregnant. So a test that performs really well, not only has to be able to say whether somebody is indeed pregnant, but also be, has to be able to say whether somebody is, is not pregnant. Okay, so a receiver operating characteristic curve wants to distinguish um, case from non-case, but ultimately no test is perfect. So we have a line of random chance down the middle and with increasing performance, the curve moves into the top left-hand corner. Okay, now we measure the area under the curve. And so the area as it approaches one tells us that our test is, is better than random chance. Okay, so that's where we want to go. Now for two combinations that we uh, found, we found that the area under the curve was 0.76 or 0.83, which is pretty good um, to be able to distinguish whether the urine from a, a random person that is totally unlabeled belongs to one of the two different groups, whether they are asymptomatic or whether they have symptoms suggestive of very early overactive bladder. So our urinary biomarker fingerprints, these combinations are sensitive and specific to overactive bladder. And so sort of for comparison's sake, you'll be familiar with HCG, which is a biomarker used to um, determine whether somebody is pregnant, and PSA, which is used to determine whether somebody uh, perhaps has prostate cancer. And our combinations perform um, arguably better than the similar tests at early stages of their development. And there've been various kind of bells and whistles that have been added on to these different tests in order to improve this diagnostic performance. But in their early stages, this is, this is where they started, okay? So that's what we um, discovered and, and, and published. And what we're doing now is to develop a test to be used in the point of care setting. So that test has to be cheap, easy to use with a rapid outcome and non-invasive because that's what the patients and their carers and healthcare practitioners um, asked for. That's why we had such a long and boring title. I'm sorry about that. Um, but it also has to be suitable for use in a point of care setting. So no proteomics, no genomics, but a simple, um, a simple test is, is what we need. Okay. And this is what we envisage. So we have a urine sample, we have a, a device that's dipped into the urine sample. It's read by a smartphone, interpreted by a smartphone. And then um, what we want to do is to have a telemedicine service available so that a patient or a carer can get instant access to provide, um, you know, uh, essentially either a diagnosis or, or, or uh, in, information about what treatment would be suitable for that particular patient, depending on their age and other characteristics. So this is what we're working towards. And in time, we'd like to develop a companion diagnostic so that we can assess the efficacy of different treatments to determine which drug would be best for that patient based on their biomarker profile. And so my final data slide, um, and it's not really that, is it? Um, I have the timeline for, for doing this. So we recently got funding to develop a commercial prototype. In 18 months time, we'll begin a clinical trial as well as health economic analysis. And in late 2023, we'll begin adoption. So in summary, at the same time as I let the cat in, because uh, I, what I'd hate for her to do is to do a, a dirty protest in the, uh, in the living room. Um, I have a background that is fairly traditional, but I chose to apply, oops, sorry about that, is to apply it to a poorly understood, a poorly researched area where I felt that there was a need to apply a, a different skill set and a different approach. Um, and then despite being in that area, I've wanted to take some of the really exciting approaches used in other disciplines such as cardiology and apply those to urology to try to make some advances. 
and you know if I could say one thing to you all it, it would be don't be scared to um, see if you can lend your skill set and your passion to other areas it could be a collaboration it doesn't mean to say you have to change your your discipline but I think um, there's huge scope there to apply your your skill set to other areas and to have a huge benefit in doing so in our case that has led to us developing a tool that hopefully will benefit patients and healthcare providers um, so um, yeah I think there can be some advantages to taking that kind of open mindset um, so lastly I just want to thank the many people involved in this research as well as the many funders that have allowed it to progress and, and thanks to you all for your time today so thank you for indulging me I'm very grateful to you all thank you